Hello, historical geology students. Um, this is the last video for this week, uh, February the 15th to the 21st. And last time I showed, we talked a little bit about numerical dating, which comes from radioactive isotope decay. And when radioactive isotopes decay, and they can do so primarily through alpha decay and beta decay, they generate heat, and that's where Earth's internal heat comes from. And that heat is what that's inside of the Earth, and gets uh, the deeper in the Earth you go, the, more, the higher the temperature goes from these radioactive isotopes. That's what drives plate tectonics. That's what causes plates to spread apart at mid-ocean ridges and to subduct into the Earth at deep ocean trenches. Uh, 1903, uh, Pierre and Marie Curie discovered radioactive decay, and in 1907, a Canadian geologist by the name of Ernest Rutherford determined that you can use radioactive isotopes to figure out how old rocks are. All you need to do is find out the half-life of a radioactive isotope, and then you, what you do next is you, ca you determine how many parent atoms there are and how many daughter atoms there are. Then you know how many half-lives have gone by, and then you multiply the number of half-lives that have gone by by the half-life of the radioactive isotope to figure out how old the rocks are. The specific device that's used to count the amount of parent and daughter atoms in a rock sample is called a mass spectrometer. If you were to get a master's degree at the University of Tennessee or, or um, Penn State or where, uh, Leeds University in Britain or wherever you are, you would use a device like this, and it's called a mass spectrometer. And the way a mass spectrometer works is you send beams of electrons through a mag through a magnet, and then the high the heavier isotopes get concentrated and they, they're counted in one tube and the lighter isotopes in other tube and this all shows up on your computer and you know how many parents and daughter atoms you have you calculate that you uh, change that into percentages and then you can figure out how many half-lives have gone by and then once you know uh, how many half-lives have gone by you multiply that number by the half-life of that radioactive isotope and you know how old the rock is. I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, th these numbers are accurate because uh, let's say you had a rock and you split it into four pieces, and you get and one piece you gave to University of Tennessee to to um, figure out uh, how old the rock is. You send one to um, Penn State University, and you send another one to University of London, and another one to University of Tokyo, and you don't tell those other three colleges. Uh, where the rock came from, or don't give them anything. Just give them the rock in the mail. And if each of those four universities gets the same number, that's pretty accurate. If you use other radioactive isotopes and you get the same number, that's uh, if you know anything about statistics, that's, about, that's pretty solid evidence. That's extremely solid evidence as to how old things are. Um, here's a diagram that shows you three types of radioactive decay. We're, we didn't talk about this one here. It's called electron capture because it's the rarest one. For this class, you only need to know these two, alpha decay and beta decay. With alpha decay, the parent isotope releases two protons and two neutrons so that the daughter isotope is going to have an atomic number of minus two and an atomic, number, a ma atomic mass of minus four. And in the previous video, I gave you examples of that. 
With beta decay, an electron is shot out of the parent nucleus due to the splitting of a neutron to, a, to form a proton and an electron. And that electron is shot out, and that's what the beta particle is, so that the daughter is going to have lost a neutron but gain a proton. And the bottom line is the daughter is going to have an atomic number of plus one and an atomic mass that's equal to that of the parent. Let's take a look at how alpha and beta decay work uh, by looking at radioactive, radioactive decay for the radioactive isotope uranium-238. Uranium-238 is going to undergo alpha decay. That's, each of these blue arrows is alpha decay. And it's going to produce a daughter. Who's the daughter of uranium-238? Thorium-234. You can see the atomic number went down by two. Then with beta decays, which are red arrows, the atomic number goes up by one. So thorium-234 is going to make its daughter palladium-234. Palladium-234, it's radioactive too. And it's going to produce its daughter, uranium-234. Uranium-234 undergoes alpha decay, producing thorium-230, which produces radium-226, which produces radium-222. And it doesn't end until you hit lead-206, which is a stable isotope. It's not going to change into anything else. So uh, this is called a radioactive decay series. It shows you all of the daughters that come out of uranium-238. So, please don't forget what a half-life is. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the radioactive isotope parent atoms in a sample to change into daughter atoms. And um, what this diagram is trying to show you is how much daughter you have. At the beginning, you have zero daughter. After one half-life, you have one half-daughter. After two half-lives, you have three-quarters daughters. And after four half-lives, you have 15 sixteenths daughters. Here you can see a diagram showing you how half-life works. And now let's work with parents. How, what percentage of the atoms in a sample will be parent atoms at the, when the rock is formed? 100%. You haven't had any time to form daughters. So that's why all these little dots are blue. They're all parent atoms. After one half-life has gone by, you have half parent, half daughter. So half of these marbles are blue and half of them are red. After two half-lives, how much parent is left? What's well, a half of a half of a half? A quarter. So you have one quarter parent and three quarter daughter atoms. After four half-lives have gone by, you have one sixteenth parent and fifteen sixteenths daughters. Five half-lives, you have one thirty-second parent and thirty-one over thirty-two daughters. So as time goes by, do you get more parent atoms in the sample or more daughter atoms in the sample? Obviously, you get more daughter atoms the older the rock is, right? As more time that passes, the less parent isotopes are left. And this curve is called an exponential curve, where you get closer and closer and closer to zero, but you never get there. Okay, let's see if you understand this concept of half-life. Earlier on, we talked about carbon-14. And the daughter of carbon-14 is nitrogen-14. So let's write that down. So carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope with an atomic mass of 14 and an atomic number of 6. And it makes a daughter called nitrogen-14. I'm sure you've heard about carbon dating before. Carbon-14 changes into car to nitrogen-14 by releasing a beta particle. So that the atomic mass of the daughter is the same as the parent, 
but the atomic number of the the atomic number of the daughter is plus one when compared to its parent. The half life of carbon fourteen. is how how many years it is 5730 years so the, the half life of carbon 14 is 5730 years how many after one half life or 5730 years how much of carbon-14 will be left in a sample? I'll repeat that. After 5,730 years have gone by, or one half-life has gone by, how much carbon-14 is left in the sample? 50%, right? After two half-lives, which is equal to 11,460 years, how much of the original parent is left? 25%. So that you, in your sample, you've got 25% carbon-14 and 75% nitrogen-14. Or you have three nitrogen-14 atoms for every carbon-14 atom. After three half-lives have gone by, which is 5,730 times three years, 15, oh shoot, I, I'm not gonna, uh, let's see here. So after three half-lives have gone by, how many years have gone by? That's 5,730 times three, 17,190 years. After 17,190 years have gone by, how much of the original carbon-14 is left? 12.5%. After four half-lives of carbon-14 have gone by, how many years have gone by? 5,730 times four is 22,920 years. So if a rock is 22,900 22, years old, How much of the original parent is left? Half of a half of a half of a half, an eighth. Or, in numbers, 6.25%. So, let me ask you a question now. Why, can you use, think about this, if you understand half-life, you should be able to understand, answer this question. Why can't, carbon-14 dating be used to date rocks that are millions of years old? Think about it. Why can't carbon-14 be used to date rocks that are millions of years old? Well, after millions of years go by, are you, you're going to have hardly any carbon-14 left, right? So you can't accurately determine the age of a rock using carbon-14, you're going to need isotopes with much longer half-lives, such as uranium-238, which has a half-life of four and a half billion years. Um, the, uh, or uranium-235, which is, has a half-life of 704 million years. Or potassium-40, which has a half-life of 1.3 billion years. So in order to date very ancient rocks, we need, can't use carbon-14 because its half-life is too short. We need to use radioactive isotopes with longer half-lives. The other thing you want to know is that uh, of the three types of rocks, igneous and metamorphic and sedimentary rocks, igneous rocks are the best for numerical dating. Why is that? Well, when an igneous rock forms, it forms from magma, and crystals come out in the, in the magma. And when the crystal forms, there's no daughters in it. 
So it's a time capsule. And as time goes by, you have more and more daughters. And you can figure out how old that rock is by counting the parent and daughter atoms in a crystal in an igneous rock. And once you know the half-life of that radioactive isotope, you can figure out how old that igneous rock is. So of the three types of rocks, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary, igneous rocks are the best for numerical dating. Why are dates not reliable for metamorphic or sedimentary rocks? Well, think about it like this. When a metamorphic rock forms, it's formed due to an increase in pressure, pressure pr increase in pressure, an increase in temperature, and or hot fluids. So it's changing, but it might change for a long time. And during that time, parents and daughters can escape from the rock. So you're not getting an accurate number when you're dating metamorphic rocks. Why aren't dates from sedimentary rocks usually not reliable? Well, the reason is quite simple. Think about um, a, a, a common sedimentary rock like a sandstone. A sandstone is made out of sand grains, a whole bunch of sand grains inside of a rock, maybe thousands and thousands of sand grains. Where did these sand grains come from? They came from the erosion of pre-existing rocks. So that this sand grain may have come from a granite that's 400 million years old. And this sand grain may have come from a metamorphic rock like Nice and be three, 380 million years old. This one, this sand grain would, might give you another number, 240 million years old, because it came from another rock. So it's meaningless to date most sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. The only way you can date a sedimentary rock is, is if you have fossils. And... and if you know how long that, that species of life has been on the planet. Let's say you had a cephalopod, a type of um, squid-like creature that we'll talk about later on, cephalopod. And this cephalopod has only been found in rocks that are 290 million years old. to rocks that are as young as 270 million years old. Then we could use that to date the rock. So you can date sedimentary rocks if you have fossils that have lived on the planet for a relatively short amount of time. On the other hand, some species of life like cockroaches have been here since 540 million years ago and unfortunately they still exist today so if you find a cockroach in a rock you can't date a rock because that rock could be 540 million years old it could be 480 million years old it could be it could have formed yesterday it could have formed during Julius Caesar's time it could have formed a hundred thousand years ago so when you have fossils that have lived for a limited amount of time they appeared on our planet and disappeared in a short amount of time. Yes, you can date sedimentary rocks, but otherwise, you can't. Uh, igneous rocks are the best rocks for dating. Let's think a little bit about how carbon-14 dating works. Why does How does carbon-14 dating work? Well, we already talked about the fact that carbon-14 changes into its daughter, nitrogen-14. And the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. So that after 5,730 years is passed by, you would have 50% carbon-14 in your sample and 50% nitrogen-14 in your sample. If you like to use fractions instead, you'd have half carbon-14, half nitrogen-14 in your sample. Or if you like to use ratios instead, you'd have a one-to-one -one ratio of carbon-14 to nitrogen-14 in your rock if it is 5,730 years old. So the way carbon-14 works is this. All living things contain carbon. Our, we, all life forms on planet Earth are based on the element carbon. You, are, are, you your German shepherd, um, cockroach, 
some bird flying high over the skies in Africa right now. Some snake slithering across the rainforest in Indonesia. Um, a fish in the Atlantic. All living things are consist of carbon. When you die, or when any living thing dies, when any living thing dies, it has the same amount of carbon-14 in it. Why? Well, in order to understand why, we have to understand how life works. Um, so, uh, there's different forms of life that we're going to be talking about. And plants do something called photosynthesis, for example. Photosynthesis. And I don't like this font. It's too small. You can't see it too well, so I'm going to make it bigger. Okay, photosynthesis. So what is photosynthesis? It's what plants do. And what plants do is they take carbon dioxide and they take water in and they make sugar and they release oxygen. This is how a plant lives through photosynthesis. Photosynthesis involves taking in CO2 through their leaves, taking in water through their root systems, making a type of sugar, and which is their food, and releasing oxygen. So plants have the same amount of carbon in them because the, atmosphere, the carbon in the atmosphere is uniform. And so all plants, when they die, they have the same amount of carbon in them. Animals eat plants. And even if you had a 100% meat diet, you'd be eating anim other animals that eat plants. So all living things have the same amount of carbon in them. As soon as they die, though, the amount of carbon-14 starts to go down and the amount of nitrogen-14 starts to go up. So if you know how much, much carbon-14 is in the sample and how much nitrogen-14 is in a thing, an animal or a plant that has died a long time ago, you know how many half-lives have gone by. And you mul simply multiply that by <coughs> 5,730, and you get the age of that, how long ago that creature died. And therefore, you get the age of the rock that the animal or plant was living in. Okay. That's the end of chapter four. And chapter five is about fossils and making sense of the geologic record. And first of all, let me describe what a fossil, what is a fossil? Fossil is any evidence of past life. And a person who studies fossils and past life, he or she is called a paleontologist. People who study, uh, focus on uh, studying fossils, they, they belong to a field of science called paleontology. We're going to be looking at a lot of fossils in this class. That's what makes it different than physical geology. We're going to be studying ancient life. One 
we study fossils. We're only dealing with sedimentary rocks, not igneous and metamorphic rocks. Another way of saying it is, you will never find a fossil in an igneous rock. Why do you think that is? Well, the heat that is required to form a igneous rock is anywhere between 700 and 1300 degrees Celsius and would destroy any organic material. So fossils are not found in igneous rocks. Fossils are also not found in metamorphic rocks, which formed under increased pressure, increased temperature, or with hot fluids. Those increased pressures, increased temperatures, or hot fluids would destroy organic matter. So we only find fossils in sedimentary rocks. Paleontologists are only uh, primarily interested, 95%, interested only in 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 um, sedimentary rocks sedimentary rocks form in beds layers which we call beds and the boundaries between those beds are called bedding planes once again principal superposition you need to know when you're looking at, let's say you, were, you and I were driving down the road here in Utah. And we saw these layers. We immediately, I would immediately know and you would immediately know too because you took a geology class that these are sedimentary beds because they're layered. Almost all the rocks in Tennessee look like this. They're beds. And the boundaries between each of these beds are called bedding plains. We'd also know that the sedimentary beds on the bottom here are older than those on top. So when you're studying the history of this particular location in Utah, let's say you found that these sedimentary beds here in red were formed on land in a desert. And we find maybe desert fossils of desert creatures inside of this and other evidence that this sandstone formed in a desert. Now, this up here, let's say in the light brown, is a limestone, and it contains marine creatures in it. Things like cephalopods, which are related to octopus and squid, or um, fish that live in the ocean. Then what happened here? Well, let's say that this sandstone formed 300 million years ago. And let's say this limestone formed between 240 and 200 million years ago. The logic tells us that 300 million years ago in a desert, there was a desert here in Utah at this location. Sea level rose and covered up this area 200 million years ago and then all the way to the top, whenever that is, 160 million years ago. And then all the rocks that are younger over uh, uh, were eroded away. And so this is going to become an unconformity. In the future, when sea level rises again, it might deposit more limestone here, and you might form a disconformity. That's what a geologist would think if he went or she went to this location. Okay. We're going to call it quits for, I think you got enough information for now, but we'll go on right from this picture here next week.